The New York Times called it witheringly trenchant and hugely empathetic, both worldly and geographically precise, a novel that holds the discomforting realities of our times fearlessly before us. Chimamanda Mon, uh, Nungazi Adichie's third novel, Americana, is the story of a young Nigerian immigrant's experience in America, loosely based on her own life. The book takes readers from the halls of Princeton to Lagos, Nigeria, and back as it explores the meaning of race and nationality. Americana won the National Book Critics Circle Award this spring and has become an instant classic. Today, Ms. Ad Ms. Adichie sits down with Michelle Norris, host and special correspondent for National Public Radio, NPR, and founding director of The Race Card. Michelle. Thank you, Steve. We're in for a real treat today. Thank you so much for being with us. And I should say thank you for writing this book. If you have not read um, any of her books, you should dive in, particularly to um, dive into the book Americana, which is so interesting and of this moment because it provides this window and at the same time a mirror into issues of race and culture and class um, in this country, but also um, on the continent of Africa. And I want to talk a little bit about um, your experience in writing the book, but also the experiences that led to it. For people who haven't read Americana, can you just give us a quick sketch? Um, so Americana is about a young woman, Ifemelu, who leaves Nigeria when she's a teenager, comes to the US, spends 13 years, and then goes back to Nigeria. And in those 13 years, many things happen to her. And it's also about Obinze, who is her childhood love, who leaves Nigeria and goes to the UK, and who then returns to Nigeria. So it's, it's, for me, it's, it's a novel about leaving home as much as it is about going back home, and really about what home means, and if, if you can go back home. And they go back home, in both cases, to places that are different, and they are very different. They are. They, they have been changed. Um, by leaving home, but I think they've also come to see home differently. I think that they've changed in a way, I think we all change as we age, of course, and the hope Don't is... Don't we all? <laughs> and the hope is that we change for the better, but I think they've changed in a way that's different from how they would have changed if they hadn't left home. Mm -hmm. And while Americana is not really based on my experiences, because my life is not just very interesting, if I met us, it's a lot more interesting than my life, but I, and my life was easier in many ways than the characters, but I, I was in the US for four years before I could afford to go back home. And even then, just four years later, I had this feeling that Nigeria had left me behind. That I had wanted, in that sense in which you, you, you leave home and you create home in your mind, and then you go back, and it's, it's not what you've built up in your mind. And, and there's a sense of loss, because you imagine that things happened and you weren't there. And, how much of, of home is also tied to identity? You were asked this question recently, and your answer was, um, was, was sort of puckish. You were asked, where is home? And you said, home is where my best shoes are. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Um, and in that case, it was it's back Lagos in, in Nigeria. In Nigeria. Yes. Nigeria. Yes. Uh, but when you're thinking about identity and the identity attached to home, that's something that Ifemela went through also, mm. and that, that you probably struggled with when you left Philadelphia after college to go back home. How are those two things tied together? You know, it's interesting. I think that identity is such an interesting thing and that it, it, I find that in my life, my identity has had a lot to do with where I am. You know, that identity shifts based on where one is, really. And so when I was, when I came to the US, I, I found myself taking on a new identity. Or no, rather, I found an, a new identity thrust upon me. Thrust upon you here. I became black in America. And I really hadn't thought of myself as black in Nigeria. I think that identity in Nigeria was ethnic, it was religious, but race just wasn't present. And in some ways, I think it, it is in Southern Africa, for example, but not in West Africa. And I guess for historical reasons, um, we didn't have people stay on and take over our lands, so. How did that happen to you? I mean, when you came here, how was it made, how were you made aware that there was a particular box that you were supposed to occupy as a person of color, as a black person in America? I think of this moment as sort of the defining moment. I'm in class, it's the first essay we've written for a class, and the professor comes in and he says, this is the best essay in class, and I want to know who wrote it, and he called my name. And I raised my hand and he looked surprised. And it was a very small, fleeting moment, 
But at that moment, and I had been in the US only a few weeks, but in that moment I realized that he hadn't expected the person who wrote the best essay to be black. And so what it taught me at that moment was that to be black in America meant something. And so discovering this identity wasn't so much that I, you know, I like to say I'm happily black, so I don't have a problem at all with sort of having skin the color of chocolate. I'd buy. But it's that in this country, I came to realize that to have that meant something, that it came with baggage and with all of these assumptions, and that the idea of black achievement was a remarkable thing. Whereas for me in Nigeria, it, it wasn't. Um, it, it was norm. And I think that's when I started to internalize what it meant, and that's when I started to push back. So for a long time, I didn't want to be identified as black. And, and how, would that, how would that come up if someone said you were black, if or would you would tell them? I would say, on, on those forms that have you tick what you are, I would yes. tick other. Uh -huh. Because I would say, no, I'm not. And then or I just remember. Right human. Right, I, yeah. By the way, right now, I very happily tick black. I just want to make that clear. But um, I think, and then I remember this young man referring to me as sister, and I thought, nope, I'm not your sister. Again, it was my way of distancing myself from this identity that I had learned had very negative connotations. But what it took for me was reading, learning, asking questions. I, I went on this self-styled um, reading uh, journey where I, I read a lot of African-American history, and American history, and I started to understand. I started to, to let go of certain stereotypes. I think it's very easy when you're an immigrant and you come to this country, it's very easy to, to, it's very easy to internalize the mainstream ideas. It's easy, for example, to think, oh, the ghettos are full of black people because they're just lazy and they like to live in the ghettos, because that's sort of what mainstream thinking is. And then when you read about the sort of the American housing policies of, of the past 100 years, it starts to make sense. And then it forces you to let go of those simple stereotypes. So that's what I did. But it was, it was, um, it was a conscious effort, and it was a, an interesting journey, but still a journey. When you write about this in the book, um, you write about African Americans and Africans um, and the way that they look at each other. Yes. And there's a lot of humor in this, but there's, there's also some things that, um, that people will find recognizable. You'll laugh out loud, you'll squirm a little bit when you read this book. Was that your intention, that you yes. wanted people to do both of those things? Yes. <laughs> I was hoping people would be uncomfortable. It always makes me very happy making people uncomfortable. <laughs> true. No, but really, I mean, I, I never set out to... I, I think that my... I'm not, I don't believe in provoking for the sense of provoking. Mm -hmm. and, and just for the... It, I find that not very useful. But I do think that there are certain conversations and certain things that I think need to be said and need to be addressed and hopefully need to be made better. And that for those things to be done, we need to get to a place where we are uncomfortable. And if squirming um, is a consequence of that, then I think that's fine. So, so leaning into discomfort. Yes, I think discomfort is a necessary condition for, um, for a certain kind of justice, a certain kind of progress. Yes. When you write a book and you put a story out there, and in some ways this was also your story, mm -hmm. When it's so personal, those stories come back to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested that you wrote a book that touches on so many sort of hot button issues. You went there on these issues. What came back to you now that you've been traveling, not just throughout America, but throughout the world, talking about that book and talking about these issues? How do people respond to it? I love that you said you went there, because actually a number of women have said to me, mostly black women, I said, you went there. Girl, you went there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A woman said to me, I can't believe you went there. <laughs> Which, for me, actually, I have to say, is one of the loveliest compliments I have received about the book. There are people who, um, you know, there are people for whom I think the novel then becomes a kind of, not so much a validation of their own experience, but a, I think that as human beings, we want to see ourselves reflected in stories. And I think that that novel, for many people, is a reflection of a story that's theirs, but hasn't really been told, mm -hmm. they haven't really seen that reflected in, in contemporary literature. I think also there are people who are uncomfortable. Um, there are people, and I find this particularly in the US, I find that for British readers, British readers are all very happy to say to me, oh, isn't racism in America terrible? 
to, to which I then say, well, you could look in your backyard. You don't actually have to go all the way to America. Right? I find that American readers, um, there's often sometimes a defensiveness where people will say to me, well, what about racism in Nigeria? And I think, well, but that's not what the book is about. You know, it's sort of like saying, let's talk about mangoes. And somebody says, well, what about rabbits or something? It's really <laughs> random. And, but I also find that for, for a number of people, it's, it's also a learning tool. The, the people who've said to me that the book made them think differently about things. Mm. And I really value that. I, I find it, I mean, lately I've been thinking of the idea of storytelling as social utility. How we can actually, through st telling stories, start to understand one another better. And so people who've said to me, I read your book and I'm starting to think really differently about some things, it makes me very happy. And, and I hear that quite a bit. So it's people thinking differently about race, for example, but also thinking differently about black women's hair. You which... spend a lot of time talking about <laughs> hair in, in the book. I, I spend a bit of time, yes. I think, that, I think that hair, I think that black hair in particular, I think is a very interesting subject. And I think that, you know, whole novels have been written about baseball, so why can't we write whole novels about hair? <laughs> it just seems to me... <laughs> Is that one of the things that American women comment on in particular? Yes. Because, you, you know, a lot of what happens, I'm going to let you in on a secret, there are things that happen in a beauty shop that you're not supposed to talk about <laughs> outside the beauty shop. It's sort of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Um, but you take that conversation and put it on the page for everybody to see. <laughs> I do, yes. I, but hey, um, not everything. There's certain things I didn't put. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I felt I, I think you know. Yes, it's it's the story of sort of the hair salon. But I think it also that in a larger sense, it's a political yes. that that the, that the hair salon is a political space. I think it is, and and that the conversations that happen there. It's about agency. Yes, it is. Very much so. And so it was important, I think it was important for me to, I don't think I could have told that story. And it's also a story of Ifemel as a character coming into her own in many ways. Right? That's kind of a hackneyed expression, but it's still true that she becomes fully herself. And, and that journey involves the hair salon as a political space. You talk a lot about um, the danger of a single narrative. Yeah. When one story, um, defines an entire class of people, an entire community. Uh, and right now, one of the things I know you're a little bit concerned about is the relationship between America and Africa and a single story sort of overtaking that narrative. And, mm -hmm. and right now the concern that, that that single story might be something that we've talked quite a bit a lot about today is Ebola. Right. Ebola seems to be the latest. I suppose every, there's kind of an Ebola panic in this country. I was in Nigeria, you know, I've been here the past month, so I was in Nigeria when we had Ebola in Nigeria. We've been declared Ebola free. And watching the American reaction to Ebola has been very interesting to me because one of the things it's, it's and I've been happy to observe that watching all the sort of the fumbling and, and the mumbling that's been a, that's around that subject has made me realize that not dealing well with this sort of thing is not the exclusive preserve of Nigerians, <laughs> and, which has been a nice thing to learn. But also, I think the way that it's been covered in the mainstream American press has been very troubling to me. Uh, the way that the distinctions are not made, so it just becomes this Africa. Right? So people will say, you've come from Africa, therefore you're likely to have Ebola. And I don't mean sort of fringe reporting, I mean mainstream mm -hmm ostensibly you know, responsible press. And the way that even Nigeria has been covered, so Nigeria has been Ebola-free, but I, I, in reading the coverage in the US, it's been attributed to everything but Nigerian action. So the, the US newspapers will say it was because the CDC sent experts, and it was because so-and-so, and it was because you know, Cookie Monster came down. But, but the thing is, the, the reason that Ebola was, was um, contained in Nigeria was because of Nigerian action. It was largely because of Nigerian action, but that hasn't been told. And I think the reason it bothers me so much, I think, is because it feeds into the same old narrative of Africa as the place with no agency. Um, you know, if anything good happens there, it has to be attributed to somebody else that's somehow not of that place. And, and it's not even so much about offending me or offending anybody. It's also just untrue. It's, it's factually wrong. And I think that the American readership that's being served to that kind of garbage, it's a disservice to them because they're not being told the truth. 
And um, so, yeah, I mean, the whole Ebola coverage and the way that it's been, the way that the African presence has been turned into a kind of um, the scary other thing is very worrying to me. There's, there's no humanity. When you wrote this book, you said that you very much wanted to encourage people to become more curious about Africa and more curious about race and more curious about storytelling. Mm. And I think you have probably achieved all of that and more. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Thank you.